I'd like to bring this meeting of the school committee to order and ask you to join with me in the Pledge of Allegiance. <clears throat> I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> we have unfortunately lost two members of our educational community, Frank Marino and David Neary. And in a moment, we're going to take a, a second from our business meeting to, to remember them and to support their families. Frank was a moderate special needs teacher uh, with us for 13 years. And David Neary was a vocational technical teacher also with us for 13 years. He was a plumber. He was the, the plumber at the, the book program. That's correct. No. School department. Okay. okay. Um, so uh, please join me in a moment of silence. Thank you very much. Is there anybody attending tonight's meeting who isn't already on the agenda who would like to speak to the school committee? We'll do our student representatives now, and we'll start with uh, Ed from Plymouth North. Thank you. 17 Plymouth North High School students attended the Harvard Model UN um, conference held in Boston from January 25th to January 28th. The conference consisted of students from all over the nation and world. Plymouth North students were delegates of Denmark and debated real international issues working towards drafting a formal resolution. All students represented, represented Plymouth North in an engaged and respectful manner. The experience is both fun and educational for all. The Science Fair will be held on Tuesday, February 13th at Plymouth North High School. Student registration will begin at, begin at 3 p.m. The fair will be open to the public from 7 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. Winners will continue to the South Shore Regional Science Fair being held at Bridgewater State University on March 11th. Good luck to all of our students that submitted projects. Winter recess begins on Monday, February 19th. Students will return to school on Monday, February 26th. Plymouth North Academic Program Orientation will be held on Tuesday, February 6th at 6.30 p.m. During the event, parents and current 8th grade students that will attend North in the fall will be given a tour of the building, receive an academic overview from the department heads, be introduced to the Freshman Academy, and learn about clubs and sports offered. Report cards were distributed Monday, January 29th. All students arrived home from the report cards on that day. The sale of cap and gowns will begin on Feb began on February 1st and will run through February 16th. Orders may be placed before or after school in Miss Allen's room, room 331. The cost is $25. Check your money order only made payable to PNHS SAF. Thursday, February 8th, the Plymouth North and South Guidance departments will be hosting the fourth annual Advanced, pa Advanced Placement Orientation Night for students and parents. It will be held from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. at Plymouth South High School in the cafeteria. This night will afford students and their families the opportunity to hear about AP classes and the benefits of taking AP classes. The DECA district competition was held in Quincy on Thursday, February 1st. Marketing students compete for a position to present at DECA States. The Massachusetts Education International Program scheduled a visit last week to Plymouth North with 17 exchange students from China. The students stayed with host families and followed a regular schedule with their host student. While in class, they were exposed to the way we teach in the United States with smaller class sizes and interactive, cl interactive classroom environments. Today, we're honored to have teachers from the same area visiting classrooms and our school. In China, generally speaking, class sizes are approximately 50 students to one teacher. The method of teaching is, is lecture. Um, teachers were very interested to hear about cl classrooms with project-based lessons and smaller class sizes. In addition, many lessons on topics of 
administration, special education, and scheduling were given, a tour of Plymouth North High School left Chinese students in awe. MCAS biology retests began to, will, be, will begin to, today, Monday, February 5th. The last day for makeups is Thursday, February 8th. Come experience an epic night of high fashion. Plymouth North Deco Department presents the second annual fashion show, the A La Mode Fashion Show, on Wednesday, February 7th at 7 p.m. Tickets are $5 at the door. Thank you. Megan. Hello. Um, this Wednesday, we will have our annual Advanced Placement Breakfast and Recognition event. This year's guest speaker is alumni Audrey Medeiros, who currently works at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. Approximately 300 students will be honored for their hard work and dedication in their AP classes. This Friday, we will host the annual Strategies for Success Breakfast for students and parents of academically at-risk freshmen. This event has proven to help reduce our grade 9 retention data, which has been an all-time low over the past few years. Thank you to those PSHS families and employees for hosting our students from China last week, and a big thank you to our student ambassadors who teamed up with our guests by taking them to classes and lunch as well as after-school activities during the week. We had a blast and really enjoyed our time with the students from China. Congratulations to the following music students who auditioned and were accepted to the SEMSVA Music Festival for 2018. The, for the Senior Festival, Quinn Woodworth on bassoon, grade 12, and Lillian Holmes for trombone in grade 10. For the Junior Festival, we had Caroline Pereira on flute for grade 9. The annual Tech Expo, which was held in PSHS Gymnasium and was followed by the grade 8 parent night, took place last Thursday. Over 1,200 middle school students had the opportunity to visit each of the Tech Studies exhibits and ask questions. The parent portion focused on the academic program of studies and the many offerings we have at PSHS. Congrats to the wrestling team for capturing their Patriot League title last week and finishing third overall at the state tournament. Also, Coach Mark Larranger earned his 400th career win. Congratulations to the dance team for receiving first place honors at the Emmanuel College dance competition this past weekend. And also congratulations to Kendra McIntosh on being named Patriot League MVP for winter track. And tonight, our Student Council Executive Board is making pillowcases for Ryan's Cases for Smiles. It, we made over 15 bright, colorful pillowcases, which are donated to um, children's hospitals to put a smile on the kids' faces. And that's all we have for tonight. Okay, thank both of you for that report. Excellent. We're down to old and new business committee members, and we will start with old business. Committee members from the old business list to address any one of those issues? Okay. How about new business? Anybody have any items to bring up? From central office, anything under new business? No, we don't. Okay. Reports and proposals from the superintendent. Dr. Maestas? Yes, tonight I have a few re um, items to report on. The uh, first item, uh, I did include this into the agenda. Uh, we did get an invitation from uh, the uh, American Society of Curriculum Development, which is a, a really a, a, a pretty substantial organization. It's the Association for Supervision and Curriculum. And uh, we actually had an invitation uh, with the Center for Secondary School Redesign and ASCD to submit uh, or to, there was an invitation for a team from Plymouth to attend and present at uh, the, the national conference, which is in Boston this year. So we're very fortunate for our schools to be selected. And I'd like to just read for you a little bit of uh, what the letter says. It says, your school is one of 18 high-performing K through 12 schools selected by both our organization to sh both of our organizations to share the successful strategies you developed to meet your students' needs. Your commitment to innovative student-centered learning has made your school's story one we believe will benefit all in attendance. So, there will be schools from all over the country that will be there, and uh, we have done work in the past with the Center for Secondary School Redesign. This is the first time that I can re recall that we have presented uh, at ASCD, which is one of the uh, premier national opportunities for uh, curriculum development, which is uh, a great honor for our students, excuse me, for our staff, 
Uh, Mrs. Fry, I believe, will be attending and um, actually helping with the presentation. So that, that's an honor for our staff to be recognized to actually participate in this. So uh, we will uh, give you some information shortly after they get back and kind of let you know how things went. The next thing that I want to give you an update on is uh, we did move our planetarium grand opening because of weather. And uh, the planetarium grand opening is moved to March 11th, uh, 2018 at 6 p.m. And that'll be uh, here at PCIS. So it'll be, uh, uh, once again, the grand opening for the planetarium will be March 11th, uh, 6 p.m. Uh, uh, here in this building. Okay. Sunday. It's Monday. Monday. It's a Monday. It's a Monday. The 11th, the 11th is, a is a Sunday. Sunday. Then, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, then I put it in wrong. <laughs> it was the 12th. Then. The 12th. Sorry, which, what is it? 12th. Okay. 12th. At 6. The 12th. 12th. March 12th. Yeah, Monday. 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 Yeah. Monday. March 12th. At 6. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, no. And uh, the next item I have to report on is I. I uh, was not here at the last school committee meeting, and I know that some of you have probably, I know you, I announced that I was going to be going on the memory mission, and I, um, I think some of you may have, read, may have read in the newspaper and online the, the trip was a, a success, and I had the opportunity to actually work with uh, some of Mrs. Hunt's uh, colleagues from the PTA, the National School Board, um, and I, I tell you it was a very exciting opportunity to uh, just go and do some uh, some work in the Dominican Republic. Um, you know the uh, the need is great, and one of the things that I uh, really uh, uh, take away from me is, you know, we we have need all over the world. You know, we have need in our own country. Um, but one of the things that I I really learned while I was there is, uh, you know, um, you know our our country is so wealthy and we have so many things going for us, and we seem to be so uh, at times ungrateful for even when we give. And we do things for people. And in the Dominican Republic, you know, I really learned that they have so little and are so grateful and so happy that you just spend time with them. And I think it's a great opportunity. And I know tonight we'll hear from uh, some of our teachers that are going to be going again and taking kids. I think it's important for our kids to see that. I think it's important for our kids to actually realize that if they want to see change, it starts with them. And one of the things that I did leave. Um, this mission trip uh, realizing is it means absolutely nothing for me to go on a trip like that without doing something. And I think that's one thing I'm uh, excited to do in the future is, is to look at how we, we as adults and, and students can do more to try to help people, not only to help them to um, gain things that they may not have, but how to teach them how to become more sustainable and how to be uh, you know, it's, it's amazing that Costanza Dominican Republic is a community of 90,000, and they only have seven schools. We're a community of almost 60,000, we have 13. And we have kids that don't go to our schools, so, you know, it's, uh, it's amazing that uh, there's so much need there, and, and I, I'm motivated to do more to try to help um, the Dominican Republic and other, other communities. Um, and I think we'll be working on that moving forward, and I. I'm uh, compelled to take a group back and, and do some work of uh, adults um, and try to do some, uh, some good and, and hopefully we'll involve some more students along the way. The next thing I have to report tonight is we did have, uh, we actually had 36 students visiting from China. They were here for four days. And I want to tell you, I have to give a, a huge uh, shout out to our host families. Uh, we had uh, numerous host families that actually did a fantastic job. And it was double time because one, one of those days it was a snow day. So we had kids uh, that experienced uh, sledding in Manomet. Uh, we had, um, I had pictures of uh, kids making snowmen in front yards, which was, uh, they had an unbelievable time. And as Eddie said earlier tonight, that they're very fascinated on how different our education system is. Uh, you know, they, um, they kind of laughed on Sunday when we introduced the host families to the kids. Um, they were kind of uh, got a kick out of how we go to school six hours a day. Uh, they go to school about 11 hours a day. Elected and it's very rigorous. Um, and when they went in and, and they went into some of our classes, they were in awe of the student-teacher ratio compared to what they're used to. Um, but they're also very interested in learning how teachers form relationships with kids. 
Uh, the teachers have said that, the administrators have said that, and you know, as uh, Dr. Sorensen and I toured uh, no, numerous schools in China, I think that is a growing theme in China is how, how, do, uh, how do they meld a little bit of both worlds, and that's something that we'll, we'll look forward to, to working on with, uh, with our colleagues in China moving forward. Uh, next item I have to report is uh, Dr. Campbell is not here tonight. He's in Washington, D.C. at our Drug-Free drug -free Communities Grant Mandatory Meeting. As you're aware, we did receive a $500,000 grant, and he is um, the key facilitator of that grant, and, and he had a mandatory meeting that started today, and he will come back on Friday. So it's uh, almost a full week of uh, finding out what you need to do to meet the guidelines of a federal grant. So that's what he's there for. and. Um, Usually when Dr. Campbell flies, his flight is delayed, uh, but he made it this morning on time, so we're happy that he got there safe. Um, the next item is the last I have to report on, and it's uh, relative to the budget. Um, Mr. Cosson and I met with the Finance Subcommittee, uh, um, Subcommittee for Education um, about a week ago, a week and a half ago, and we spent about two hours with them just walking through the budget. I think they were uh, very happy that we um, we're open and transparent about how we build the budget. We asked, answered all the questions they had. Um, they did say at the end of the meeting that they don't, don't look forward to a long town meeting because they believe the budget uh, across the town will be a, a challenging as we enter town meeting. Um, but um, I think we both felt very good about the conversation, um, the questions they asked, the dialogue we had. So. Uh, we, feel, we felt good about the meeting, and uh, at this point, we'll just look forward to uh, continuing to spread the word on how we built our budget and what's in it, and we'll look forward to getting ready for town meeting. So with that said, uh, Dr. Sorensen, I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Thank you for all that information. Committee members, with any questions or comments following uh, Dr. Maestas' report? Cool. Uh, when is town meeting this year, this spring? Do we have a date? April. It's April 7th. Oh, we're in Texas? We're in oh. Texas, I think. So is that, that, that kind of happens, right? <laughs> we'll have a couple of members that won't be able to make it because of uh, okay. National School Board, right? Um, I actually had um, uh, spent most of my time lunches and so on with uh, Miranda, who's the mm -hmm. National School Board uh, uh, past president. And what a wonderful, wonderful indiv individual. Um, and, and you know her. I know her from D.C. last yeah. year. Well, yeah. she's, uh, she's a powerhouse. And I tell yeah. you, she, uh, she had an influence on all of us. Um, but it was not the, you know, and where I first heard about the memory mission was at the National School Board Conference when I presented there in San Francisco. And I saw that award. Uh, they got an award for being a community service company. And um, I said, I would love to go on that. That would be really cool. And who would have known all these years later I would get selected to go. But that was really cool. Going back to your report on the, on the Chinese students, uh, I understand uh, that uh, Chinese educators are very interested in the way we, we educate our students, and I think there's a gain from that side. The other way around, I'm, I'm hoping there's a way that our students can observe the work ethic yes. of Chinese students. Absolutely. And in that case, it'll be a good swap because that, that's what we, you know, yeah. you said, you know, we, our students take a lot of things for granted yes. that others don't have in the world. I just wish there was a way we could model that work ethic. Well, you know, Dr. Sorensen, one of the, I, I mentioned this uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, one of the takeaways that one of our kids had mentioned uh, when they were at, at my house, uh, we had the kids over at the house and one of the parents said, you know, her, my daughter's grades are, they're, they're, they've never been so good because they are working side by side with their Chinese sister that is there studying in, in our schools. Yeah. And it's pretty amazing how they just have this uh, drive to succeed and drive to study. Um, you know, they've been preparing for our, our MCAS exams, which which to them are challenging, not because of the content, but because of language. And I will, I will tell you that the amount of time they put in in preparing has been um, outstanding. Just they, they, uh, they, they're, doing, they're doing really well. And I would just add to the, tell the committee that uh, last week I had a conversation with an attorney 
from Homeland Security uh, discussing uh, the, the, the possibility that uh, these students from China and other countries could spend more than one year here. So, and Dr. Sidman has been, I mean, Dr. Uh, Maestas, well, that's, that's a, a that's, that's, that's a name from the past, huh? <laughs> <Whoops. Right. laughs> Many people don't even know who I'm talking about. <laughs> I've been here a long time, but not that long. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Maestas is working on that, as that as well, so well, it's something we're we trying to, to, to fix. 9-11 is what changed yeah, it. Yeah, 9 changed it. Yeah. Yep. Okay, let us move on then, uh, before I mess this up anymore. Uh, retirements, please. Um, yes, um, we have two retirements to report tonight. Um, Carol Faria, who's a cosmetology teacher at Plymouth South High School for the past 23 years, and Lori Reed, a grade two classroom teacher um, from West Elementary for 34 years of service. On behalf of the Plymouth School Committee, we wish these individuals a happy retirement and thank them for the service to Plymouth Public Schools. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, correspondence, Mr. Morgan. Um, yes, we have uh, two uh, pieces of correspondence this evening. Um, the first is an email to uh, South High Principal Jim Hanna from the Shawshank uh, Valley Technical High School. Um, uh, Counselor Richard Lavoy commending South High for hosting the MAVA co-op subgroup and Maureen Kelleher in particular for the well-planned day. He praised the positive learning environment and the beautiful new school. Uh, the next piece of correspondence is a memo from Superintendent Maestas announcing the class of 2018 seniors who have qualified to receive the John and Abigail Adams Scholarship based on their performance on their grade 10 MCAS. A list of recipients from both North and South high schools is included as well as the information from the Department of Edu Education and how to use the tuition waiver and which Massachusetts colleges and universities accept the Adams Scholarship. Okay. <coughs> That's it? Me. Yes. Oh, sure. Thank you. It. Okay, it's time for our first uh, mid-cycle update. Dr. Maestas? Yes, tonight we have uh, Federal Furnace Elementary School and we have Principal Camaro with her school council and they are here tonight to present the Federal Furnace Elementary School uh, School Improvement Plan and Mid-Cycle Report. So I would like to welcome the Federal Furnace Elementary School School Council and Principal Camaro. Welcome. Thank you. And while you're getting settled, let me tell you that I was particularly impressed with the, uh, the data, uh, measurement data that you presented on goal one in your report, and I'm hoping you're going to reference that this evening. I am going to reference Great. that. Thank, Thank you, you very much, though. <laughs> So I am uh, Principal Trina Camaro from Federal Furnace, and I will let uh, my team here introduce themselves. We do have um, half of our school council here tonight, which I didn't think was, was so bad. <laughs> uh, good evening. My name is Chad here, and I'm a parent. Is there a hand mic on that table that there we can pass right along? Yep. Hi, I'm Jen Bates. I'm a fourth grade teacher at Federal Furnace. Good evening. I'm Nicole Burke. I am a kindergarten teacher at Federal Furnace. All right, so uh, do we usually do the video at the end? Or however you want. However we want. We can uh, do the updates and then do the video right. at the sounds end. Good. That sounds good to me. So um, thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you for having us. We are excited to present our mid-cycle update. So we kept our format from last year very similar because we had gotten some positive feedback that it was very easy to read. So here we have our goals for 2017 on the left uh, to 2019 and then a 2018 update. And we'll just speak to a few of these pieces. So um, first, our safe and supportive school goal. We had set out to continue our committee from the past few years formally. But then what we really found was that safe and supportive is kind of just the way we do business now, and it, it's the way we make certain decisions. So I'm going to refer to some of those decisions in a couple minutes. Um, but we did make some changes, uh, including lunch and recess. So we had had, um, you know, what 
people do is to look at the problem areas and we had had some behavioral concerns at lunch and recess. So what we did was we added a lunch and a recess. So we have fewer kids at each lunch and recess, especially for the lower grades. And we increased the amount of supervision uh, by looking creatively at schedules. So that's the type of decision we make so that we keep kids safer and happier and learning in our schools. Another change, we did make some changes to our kindergarten transition. So I'm going to hand that over to um, Nicole and Chad to talk a little bit more about that. Absolutely. Um, as a kindergarten teacher, it's very stressful for parents to release their children to us. So we had tried to make a smooth transition, um, inviting the parents and the families in multiple times to meet with all of the teachers and to mingle with all of their peers to get to know each other exclusively not just within their classroom but within the grade level itself. So then at the beginning of the school year we made a notice to parents that we were going to have kind of a transitioning classroom. We took the students and put them into groups and during part of the day for the first two weeks we would take those groups and rotate them to the different teachers so that they could mingle with their peers and other teachers could get to know the students as well. And we felt that it was a great way of integrating a sense of community into the kindergarten grade level because all of the students now feel comfortable with all three teachers and they're able to come to any of us with any concerns or any exciting news that they want to share with us instead of just going to their one teacher. So it created a great camaraderie among all three kindergarten levels. Sure. Uh, so I'm the parent of two young toddlers. Um, one was in kindergarten last year and the second is in ki kindergarten this year. And it's just been great the number of opportunities. So before school even started, we had three chances to come. One for testing and they've really made some improvements with the testing that my son was excited. He got lots of um, little toys to bring home. Um, <laughs> and then we're able to come for a family night and then the day before they started. So there's lots of opportunities um, that either myself or my partner could come and experience the school and make sure he was comfortable. Thank you very much. Um, and I did want to note specifically that um, Mrs. Burke has really helped um, facilitate a lot of these changes. We did make these very specific changes um, and families definitely felt it. We've had more than one parent who have had multiple kindergartners in the school recently note these positive changes. So thank you very much. So. Um, we have some data, as Dr. Sorensen uh, mentioned, and that's on the next slide, but we also have a few anecdotes just about how um, kids and, and families are talking about our safe and supportive community. So uh, one of my friends made me this poster, and if you can kind of see on the poster on the board, it's like a floor plan of the school. Um, Mrs. Fry, you would like that, you like floor plans. And um, she wrote, you know, thank you for keeping us safe. Um, but we really did make a lot of changes to the way um, students are supported in classrooms this year. We have lots of adults in classrooms. Our moderate, moderate special needs teachers, by and large, don't have offices anymore. They're in classrooms, and all the paraprofessionals are stationed in classrooms. There, there's a lot of movement, but because they have their homes in classrooms, um, almost no teacher is, is alone for much, um, many, for any period of time. So the kids are much more supported, as are, are the staff. So, um, Jen, I don't know if you had anything you wanted to add to that piece. In terms of the inclusion? The, yeah, and the culture, kind of that feel of, of supportiveness. Yeah, I, if I had one example that I could use, this morning I had a student um, who, in the past, would be considered, you know, somebody who we'd have a difficult time getting her to come to school, you know, uh, stre for stress reasons and whatnot. And today she came in and said to me, I was sick all weekend and my mom said I could take the day off. And I said, oh, well, why are you here? And she said, I'm not gonna miss school. <laughs> I wanna be here. And that was a great feeling to hear her say that. But also just the kids, you can tell they feel safe in the building if there is an instance where there's some type of a disruption. They don't even respond. They just keep doing their work. They know everybody's safe. and everybody's going to be taken care of. So there's been a real shift in the way the staff talks about things and the way the, the students do as well. And it also extends to accessibility of different things. So when we show our video at the end, um, half of the kids who participated in the video 
um, participate in our before school FFTV program, which is typical at all the elementary schools. There's a before school program. But we also know that we have kids for whom transportation to school before school is quite an issue, and they can't get there. So we um, created a special program for during the school day for kids who um, were in the same age level, had the same level of interest. And um, that idea actually came up um, by a few staff members, Rachel Bates, uh, Dan Sylvester, uh, and Diana Rossetti actually came up with this idea and Jen Mulvaney uh, was right on board when we brought it up to her and she's been really helpful. So um, that's part of this initiative as well, is making sure that all kids feel connected to school um, and getting through those barriers that could exist. So some of the results uh, data-wise are posted up here. So we did, we have seen some significant reductions in uh, our discipline codes. They don't add up to that final number at the bottom because I only posted the three major categories there. Um, I did also artificially inflate this year's data just in case we accidentally didn't record something. I wanted to make sure that we inflated it right from the beginning and I inflated those numbers by 10 percent and still there shows a significant reduction in the instances of battery disorderly conduct and safety violations. So a safety violation is when a teacher feels that they need another adult in the room because a child's um, behavior may be um, concerning. And that is related to our crisis prevention intervention protocol through that training that we do. So um, that's what that means. So that was mentioned earlier and I wanted to make sure that I clarified that. So on to our next goal, which is rigorous curriculum and instruction, which of course is really, really important. Uh, our biggest goal was to focus our PD on making sure that we're meeting students' academic needs, meeting them where they're at and moving them forward. The district has had a huge focus on inclusion this year, and that means um, inclusion of students at all levels, not just students who are struggling, but students who may be academically advanced as well. And we've had uh, a professional named Lisa Deeker come to the district multiple times. And we've really taken great advantage of this. For example, um, Jen and some of her teammates went to a special training just last week to follow up on the larger training that Lisa did at the full day PD in October. And our entire school year of building-based PD, so our professional development when staff stays in our building, is a continuation of that inclusion. So we've used her worksheets, her models, and uh, we've integrated those into the building-based work that we're doing to continue that work. Um, so we are really focused on that. Also, this goal was about uh, using our resources, such as our coaches, and using all of the structures in place, such as grade level meetings, staff meetings, to review data, to talk about our curriculum, to do curriculum mapping and pacing. Does anyone want to add to that, staff? Um, I was just going to share about um, our technology. Yeah, the in service. What I, yeah. what I use for um, our classroom. As a parent and a teacher, it's often helpful to be able to check in with the teacher throughout the day. And I utilize a great app that I had shared during our PD, which is called Apple Tree. And it's a way for parents to stay connected and it is almost as similar to a Facebook page, but the parents need a access code to access the information. And students' um, pictures are posted on there, things that we do throughout the day. I also share information with parents of important things coming up. Parents can message me and ask for any progress reports on their child, anything that their child might be struggling with so that they can help them at home with it. And parents can also like like the pictures, they can comment on them. So it's a social but also informational for all the families. And I've gotten great response last year out of my 18 children. I had 16 parents signed up for it. This year I have 21 students and I have 19 parents that have joined it. So it's a great way for them to stay in constant contact if anything comes up. They can reach out to me or they can reach out to other parents and communicate as well. So I really have enjoyed using that and I had shared that at one of our professional developments. 
And it, it's very important for um, parents to see pictures of what their kids are doing. I think it reinforces uh, the rigor in the instruction and the methodologies that we use. That was something school council talked about last year in writing this plan, that it's important for us to use rigorous methods, but also to publicize them and to show <coughs> families the types of things that we're doing. Absolutely. I mean, when you're a new parent and you wonder for the first week of school, what is my child up to all day? They can just pop on there and I take pictures. I post things every other day of pictures of everything we're doing, little things from reading to adding and different things so just parents have an update because your child comes home usually and you say, what'd you do today? Nothing. So this <laughs> gives them an insight onto what their child really is doing every day. And in addition to many of the classrooms are using Class Dojo, which has some similar options. Some classes do have closed Facebook pages so that the families are on just with um, that teacher. We have our Federal Furnace Facebook page, and of Mrs. Burke's class is on there today for freezing and melting, if you want to <laughs> see what they're doing in science. So we're trying to really focus on posting um, not just the feel-good moments, but the academic moments as well. And support and innovation. I think I'm going to have uh, Jen Bates talk a little bit about that. Okay. In terms of um, sorry, our staff I'm support. Oh, uh, yeah. So we had recently had a choice PD session where we had uh, staff members train other staff members on areas of expertise that they happen to have. In this case, it was technology, um, using technology to work in an inclusion setting and how can you differentiate for all learners. One of the most impressive things from the Lisa Deeker thing that I brought away from it was you, this is truly all children and like Trina was saying, even the kids that are that much farther ahead, I loved how she included them in her model. So we had a great discussion in some of the PDs about what can we do for those kiddos who really need a little bit extra. How can we get them to dig a little bit deeper into the content? And I think a lot of people walked away feeling like they had something to work with. A couple people have come to me and commented about how they've already tried things. Uh, everybody was really excited about trying the new things. And also, the, when you're hearing it from someone who's a peer, I think it's just so well received when you're learning from somebody that's doing the same thing that you're doing every day. So that was, um, I think, really one of the most productive things that we've done this year. So we've been doing a lot of that type of work with this inclusion. Uh, the way we started our building-based uh, in-services for the year was with a team building uh, in-service. And Nicole's smiling over there. It was, it was fun. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> we had it facilitated by our physical education teacher and a uh, one of the physical therapists in the district, and they had us as teams uh, work together. So we worked on collaboration, communication, and as we've said, we've been continuing that throughout the year. Um, staff love to learn from each other, and it's, it's really important to support each other. Um, and up here on our PowerPoint, we list a couple of our other um, support networks. We are part of the Bright Network because we have a transitional learning center, and our staff is learning uh, quite a bit about working with kids with significant social emotional needs, and that's been a real um, bonus because all of that training is a part of that collaboration, so they have um, ongoing supports. Um, so on to the next. So part of the way that we uh, also are supporting staff is through a staff website, so um, we keep up with it regularly, and we is usually me, um, but we, these collaborative things are on there. So every in-service, every staff meeting, every grade level meeting, there's a page on the website and there's collaborative tools on there. So for example, during that technology in-service, their ticket to leave and, and head out was having to post on the Google Doc about what they had learned, uh, what their goal was, who they learned it from. And then that document is also then uh, posted as a final document in a PDF format on the website. So anyone who maybe missed it or wasn't in that room during that particular session can see, oh, if I want to learn this particular tool, I can go to this person right here in our building and I can learn how to do that. Oh, so-and-so is also trying that, so I can go to them and, and continue to the learning. Can I add something about that as a staff member? I use the website almost every day. 
I love that everything is in one place. But I also love that all the previous staff meetings are in there because, you know, you're trying to say, oh, we learned about something. I know it was a couple months ago and you can't find it. It's all right there for you. So it makes it a lot easier. And of course, we like to have fun. And when staff <laughs> feel supported, they come up with their own ideas for fun. So this was a staff idea to have a storybook dress up day. Um, it happened to be on uh, Halloween also. So it was really fun for the kids to come in and have their teachers dressed in their favorite storybook characters. And that's just one example of, of staff um, doing something for the building and building community. Yes, I do have something. Thank you. Yep. Um, as a new teacher, I felt that our staff has been working really hard last year and this year to show parents that we do want to be there for the fun things at school, not just curriculum. We've been making an effort to have a teacher volunteer at every PTA meeting. Um, we've been having teachers volunteer in lots of the fun things that happen at night. Like last week there was bingo and we had several teachers who came back and did bingo with families. So it's a great community engagement to show families to that we're there not just to educate their children but also to be part of the community and part of their family and I feel that it's very important for families to see that and our community engagement group that we work in right now is currently working on a couple different ideas of ways to reach out to all of our members of the community and make them all feel like they're part of our school which is very important to us as a community and I was just going to give the example of our Halloween dress up day. It's already been covered. <laughs> great. So um, that was a great segue. It kind of was the end of one goal and into the next one because our final goal on our plan is our um, to expand family and community partnerships. And sometimes it's hard to separate these goals because they're all so much related. Um, so that is an important piece that we have had great collaboration. Uh, PTA, there is a T in there, and we do have a lot of staff who participate in our PTA events. Also this year with um, the change from being a targeted assistance Title I program to the school-wide Title I program, we made that a big focus at Open House to do the Title I homeschool compacts together and to kind of go through how we partner with families. And um, Brendan Brady, who's another uh, school council member who was not able to be here tonight, he really wanted me to highlight that. He was going to talk about that if he was here tonight. and. Um, he actually was doing an internship in Mrs. Bates' classroom, and he mentioned something that she said um, at Open House when presenting the compact, which was that uh, parents need to know that they're on the team too. And going through each piece of the homeschool compact, there's a piece of what the school's responsibility is, what the parent's responsibility is, and what the student's responsibility is. And I read over the loudspeaker the school's responsibility. The teacher read the parent responsibilities, and the parent was supposed to read the student responsibilities to them. And then there was a goal setting activity. So that's the type of thing. We're not talking, we're talking about partnerships as far as organizations and maybe donations of time or energy or goods, but it's also a different kind of engagement. How are families helping their students to learn and how are we really partnering together? Did anyone want to add to that piece? I just think it's important for pa parents to know that they're part of the education. It's not just the school's job to educate them. It's a community. It's all of us. We're all in it together to benefit your child, who is our child, who is everyone's child. So I think, you know, expressing that more to the parents and just reiterating it over and over will eventually help these parents understand that we all need to work together to make these children the, you know, the adults that they're going to be someday. And the kids need to know that everyone is on the same page. Absolutely. So part of our original goal was to um, look at a volunteer training for our parents to get them more engaged. And as we started to look at the data in terms of who has been interacting with our um, schools, we realized that maybe we need to shift that a little bit to think about how are people engaging with us, um, not necessarily going the route of creating a volunteer program, which we may do a little bit, but we spent some time in our school council meeting trying to determine who is coming and who is not and how are they engaged, because we have a lot of engagement in some of the PTA activities, so those parents are connecting and probably in a way that makes sense for them and their schedules. Um, not everyone has the opportunity to come and volunteer or to come during a PTA. Uh, 
parent-teacher conference. So we're looking at ways to kind of collect the data to figure out how many parents are really engaging and what level they're engaging, so we can then target those. And one of the things that um, we actually, uh, the school did this year, is we reached out to everyone who didn't come to open house. And we made sure they had all the information that they missed by not attending. Um, and part of that was, I believe, a survey to figure out Why? what prevented you from coming, so we can kind of look at some of those barriers for next year. Definitely. And we did that electronically and um, hard copy. So we sent out all of the handouts from Open House um, to everybody, whether they were there or not. And then we did do an individual envelope for all families who we had on our record as not attending. We did get some responses like, I was there, I just forgot to sign in. Um, but the survey results were very interesting because the people who weren't there felt connected at least they expressed that. They said, well, the teacher had already called and we've had numerous conversations and numerous emails or I'm on that Facebook page. So that was part of the thought that we may need to rethink this goal a little bit. What exactly are we trying to accomplish here? We want people to be connected and there are different ways of doing that. And we are almost done. Um, just a little picture about our community connections and just wanted to let everyone know that Federal Furnace has a long tradition of engaging kids outside of school and in school. So we did do a few things this summer. Jen, do you want to share a little bit about that? Sure. We um, worked with the community to make a garden and the kids actually came. They took turns over the summer. They could sign up to come and take care of the garden. and. Uh, once we started to produce vegetables, they were able to pick them and bring them home or decide if they wanted to donate them or um, what was going to happen with the vegetables. I came at least once a week to kind of check in and they also logged what the garden produced and they wrote about how they felt about how it was going. So it was kind of a, a cool little project where they could reflect on what they were doing. They loved it. They want to do it again. And uh, we actually get a lot of really great stuff out of it. Mm -hmm. And um, the picture up there on the right is from our book event where we, we had two of them. One, we went out to Algonquin Heights to the community center. And we had some students, whoever was, was around, some of them were at camp, but we got a really great turnout anyway. And we met with them. We gave them free books. We actually helped even some of the alumni came down and we helped them with the list for the summer reading for PCIS or the, the math and they got to see their old teachers. So that was really fun and it was well received. The one at the school, we had a few people but it was, we wound up kind of, you know, it was a tough week because people are on vacation and we've been talking about how we'll set that up this summer so that we can do more and give parents more notice so that they can be there. But it was really great to see the kids over the summer and kind of keep the connection going. And if you haven't seen the tomato sauce videos, we are on the tomato sauce videos, video two, Federal Furnaces <laughs> feature, because we did participate in the tomato sauce initiative. And I just want to thank all of our school council members, our community, um, and all of you for having us present. And we can show our video. Great. Our school uses the zones of regulation to help make sure all of the students are in control of their actions and working on problem solving skills. We also focus on making sure all of the needs of our students are being met. We are one of the top schools who utilize the free breakfast program, which helps kids get off to the right start. We also have a kindness wall. The kindness wall is you write something kind on them and then you roll them up and stick them in. Federal Furnace is lucky enough to have a garden at our school. The Permaculture Club helps run a before school club with help from our families and students. Something very exciting in the works is we are currently working with Heritage Plantation on learning how to set up an outdoor classroom. Students here at Federal Fairness have many opportunities to be leaders. Our school has a student council, 4th and 5th grade students meet once a month where they discuss how to make the school a better place. 
Another student leadership opportunity is the peer mentoring programs. Students in fourth and fifth do one-to-one -one mentorship with younger grades. We also have buddy classrooms where cross-level grades get to work and collaborate. Some of our technology students are currently working on learning how to code and program robots. We are really excited to have virtual reality goggles coming to our classroom very soon. In library class, we are doing lots of exciting things as well. We recently created holograms by making a four-dimensional pyramid and placing it upside down on a tablet. We will be joining a second grade classroom to observe centers. Some things you will notice are the flexible seating options, technology to meet the needs of all students, and classroom libraries. This is a writer's workshop. Like in math, students are working at their own pace within a unit. There is a mini lesson and then students practice it in their own writing and share their work at the end. Questions, or are we all set? Uh, um, I, as somebody that's worked in the field of um, family and community engagement for almost 20 years now, I really appreciate all of the work that you're doing to engage your families and um, all of the different, uh, different, um, you know, unique ways that you're trying to get parents engaged, especially with going to Algonquin Heights. Um, so. I would recommend to you to work with your PTA. Um, PCIS has actually earned this award a couple of times, but they have a School of Excellence Award and it's based on family engagement. Mm -hmm. So have them look at it. It's on the PTA website. Um, and all the schools that get the um, School of Alex uh, Alexis Excellence Award get nominated to get the Phoebe Appleston Hearst Award, which also has a monetary reward as well. So. Um, I think with your unusual and all, all of the things that you do in your school, you'd be great at it and I think you'd have no problem getting that award. And if you go to PCIS, they have a banner out front that says they're a school of excellence in family engagement. So thank you very much recommend for that. that. And if they need help, they can call, they know they can call me. <laughs> thank you. Ms. Badger. I was just going to say that was a great presentation and I just want, this might be a question for Gary, that when you guys are talking about what you're doing with the kindergartners and taking them around, I just think that sounds like a great idea to, to create the community that you're talking about. I mean, they're brand new and it's a big community that they're entering. Is that something we're thinking about doing at our other schools? Because if it's really helping with that transition, it'd be a perfect thing to Absolutely. use in the other. And that's one of the things that I think we're really trying to make uh, that first experience and a return experience for our families a lot easier. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things that we have heard from parents is how to make that um, welcome into the district a lot more easy, not only from coming in and touring, but even the paperwork that we've talked about before. Yeah. So that's not so cumbersome and it doesn't feel like you're buying a house. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so that's kind of how, it, I think it's actually easier to buy a house. Than. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Okay, that was a great report. Thanks for the video, too. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Nice job, everybody. So now we have uh, Patrick Van Cott and Patty Callahan from Food Services. Dr. Maestas? Yes, uh, we are pleased to have our food service group come in tonight and present to you an update on our food service program. They have, are always looking at ways to try to stay um, in the profit-making arena with food service, which is difficult because, as you know, uh, it's a challenge to keep uh, our food costs down uh, with, the, with the tastes of our, our young students and, and the palate that they have. How, how do we try to uh, have a menu that is going to be somewhat uh, nutritious but yet on the other side profitable, which I'm not sure anyone in the community realizes this, but uh, when we do our budget presentations, the, the, the uh, food service department isn't on that budget presentation role because they are 100% self-sustaining, which is, I don't know if Patrick and Patty have this information, but there aren't a whole lot of districts in the country that have a 
food service program that runs in the black every year. It's uh, very difficult to do, uh, but I think it's also in invoked a little bit of the entrepreneurship model uh, for a district to look at how they can try to generate some funding to keep the program up and running. So with that said, I'll turn it over to, uh, to you guys and let it roll. Thanks. Thank you very much for having us uh, once again on the after the uh, Super Bowl. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say about that. Um, to begin the cut, we have to do, we're luckily we have the, the size district that we have. Um, it, it provides us with a lot of opportunity to increase our revenues and do different things um, and, and think outside of the box. Um, so the, the mundane here is the uh, 14 schools and sites, and we say the schools and sites because we've added um, onto that. Additionally to our 12, we have uh, Rising Tide and uh, the Council on Aging that we feed every single day. Uh, we feed uh, 8,195 plus students breakfast and lunch. Uh, free and reduced lunch percentage right now is at 32.79%. That's as of October. And our total is uh, 719,000 lunches and 189,000 breakfasts per year. <coughs> so we're almost to that uh, big mark there. Uh, we have a total of 70 uh, total employees, one secretary bookkeeper, um, who we couldn't do without, uh, two van drivers, one goes north, one goes south every day, uh, four managers, eight team leaders, 53 cafeteria workers, and myself and Patty. In addition to uh, the breakfast and lunch programs, uh, we do a summer food service that was serving, um, last year was about 20,000 meals. Uh, this year, um, because of adding a lot of different meal times, we've done breakfast and then snack as well at a lot of the sites. And we're doing the four sites, and the total was 23,016 meals. Um, that all converts into uh, reimbursable monies. And it's at uh, Camp Clark, the Boys and Girls Club, PCIS, and Hedge Elementary School, which is an open site. Anyone can go there under the age of 18. Council on Aging, um, it's exactly as we predicted. Uh, it was very, very staggered and, um, about how many participants we were having. And uh, now we're doing, on the average, about 45 a day. Uh, some days are much higher than others um, due to different uh, activities that they have throughout the week. Some are on-site, some are off-site. Uh, we do five days a week year-round. We staff it. And um, if not anything, we've, we've really had a great uh, community partnership with them. That's, that's the, the best moment about uh, going in there and recognizing people every time you go in there. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, on a daily basis, we do the alternative learning program, about 40 people a day. Uh, Pilgrim Academy, around 20 a day. Uh, all the Memorial Hall events, um, catering, uh, so many different uh, functions I can't even name. <laughs> um, the Plymouth ed uh, the Early Education Program, and then Rising Tide, um, for the, all for the school calendar year of 108 days. Um, we are staying afloat mainly because of all the different things that we're doing, and it's mainly the, the contracts that we've, we've brokered um, over, the, over the years. Our additional food service programs brought in about 10 years ago about $70,000. This year we'll hit around $200,000. So it's a little, little above and beyond the, the traditional breakfast and lunch programs. So. Um, lunch choices, um, we've learned the hard way <laughs> through, uh, that the kids are as fickle as they come. And um, it's constantly changing. Uh, and we found that out, uh, I'll give you a for instance, like we do at the elementary schools, the hot meal, assorted sandwich and soups, the secondary schools, the bistro, um, a lot of grab and goes because the limited time uh, to eat. Uh, World's Fair is the hot meal of the day. And then uh, we do Papa Gino's and Uno's Pizza. Papa Gino's is driving the elementary school sales like there's no tomorrow. Um, and the kids don't get bored of it. The secondary schools, however, after about two or three months, just go, eh, it's Papa Gino's. Can't we get something different? After you spend all the time brokering the deal. <laughs> so that's, that's an example of 
how the marketing works, name brand recognition, et cetera. Um, but it does change, and I mean like the tide. Uh, one of our favorite things that we did this past year was the tomato sauce initiative that uh, Trina referred to. Um, and Brian Palladino, being different than he is, uh, decided to have guest servers of the <laughs> pasta and the, and the sauce that we made out of the uh, tomatoes themselves. Um, that was a lot of fun, and he, of course, drafted me to, to uh, serve next to him. Uh, we had the uh, chief of police and uh, some other guest servers throughout the year. The, the chief of police is very generous with his helping. <laughs> the food cost was off, was off the charts that day. <laughs> the kids liked coming in and having them serve. <laughs> a lot of fun. Um, and it's just part of the garden to school initiatives. A lot of people think the farm to school and we put the gardens in. Uh, thanks to a lot of help to all the different people who've, who've uh, contributed. Um, the DOD Fresh Fruits and Programs, I was hesitant to, like, what are we going to get from a program that's called Department of Defense? And uh, <laughs> it is unbelievable, the uh, fruits and vegetables. And it really, and it goes to, um, it's allocated dollars from the government that go to military bases and schools. Um, so you learn all, never thought I'd be learning about all these different things. But the, the um, produce itself is unbelievable. And it cost us nothing. So it's good. even better than that. This helps our food cost. All right, so we had three year cycles for review and I'm still recovering from it. It was uh, the week before Christmas. <laughs> Uh, we had three reviewers come on, and they stay on for uh, five days uh, on site and make you jump through hoops, et cetera. Everyone knows about the CPR reviews. This is our, our review. Um, and a lot of it's, it's good to make sure that you know what you're doing, number one. You're a lot more accountable now than ever. Um, the amount of documents that I had to upload for them to review was just staggering. Um, you had some I had to split because it was too large to send to them. Um, but that's uh, part of the game. And it's, they review your policies, procedures. Are you doing what you're saying you're doing? Are you serving what you're saying you're serving? Um, you know, if it, all of a sudden a kid says, why don't we have french fries this week? Then it means you're doing something wrong. So, um, Nutrition analysis and guidelines, staff development and training, which is a big part um, that you have to do now. And then the community eligibility program at Hedge was reviewed too. And, and because that's a federally mandated program, that is really close to being cut again. So it may go away, unfortunately, which is a sad Washington thing that's happening. Um, resource management comprehensive review. This is our financial review. Um, and they felt ne the necessity to do this to schools because so many different school districts are running in the red. So what they do is they make sure you can understand what a profit loss statement is, a balance sheet, and how to stay afloat. And what are you doing to stay afloat? Um, so they go over for three days all the different uh, components of the profit loss statement. And one thing that we did have that stuck out a little bit, but everyone else is going through the same thing, is our lunch charges. We don't deny anyone a lunch at all. And they make it kind of difficult because what happens is you, you get all your lunch components, you come up to the POS system and they say, uh, you owe $200. So at that point, we're not gonna take the meal away from them and hand them a cheese sandwich and an apple and a milk. So we're, we're in a precarious situation here of what to do. And the best thing to do is to come up with a policy, unfortunately, I'm sure. Chris Campbell is excited about that as well. Sure he is. I'm glad he's not here this evening. Uh, but I'll be sending him a rough draft. I've been <coughs> beg borrowing, stealing a bunch of different communities uh, worth of policies. And we've got to come up with something because the it becomes a staggering amount after a while. Um, it's up over, sometimes it fluctuates up to about $25,000 that's owed to us. Um, and sometimes the kids don't understand that it's not this abyss you know, thing that you can't just go to McDonald's and say, yes, yeah, put it on my tab. You know, it doesn't happen like that. So we've got to debunk that thought process and start educating everyone that um, this is a, a monetary thing and you have to be responsible for the debt because um, it's climbing. So I'll be sending him a rough draft. 
Student trends, uh, I've often spoken that it was going to be a roller coaster of participation due to the regulations, and we're seeing a, a slight upswing right now, which is really good. So the kids are getting used to um, all the different, um, you know, the uh, whole wheat, the whole grains and things like that. Um, our a la carte sales, you know, continue to take a, a hit. However, it's starting to come back as a roller coaster as well, too. Where we were once at $187,000 in sales, we're now at 74. So it's starting to swing back. It's starting to come back, and it's mainly because the mm -hmm. manufacturers are starting to make products that are actually taste good. So mm -hmm. that's come come a long way. Important, especially with kids. <laughs> yeah. Um, our breakfast participation is another component that's really, really carrying us, um, and it's another reimbursement source. We're up over a thousand breakfasts a day, um, so a lot of times that will be everyone's meal. They'll come in at that point, and some people can just eat a meal of the day, and then they'll go home and, and eat, uh, a, you know, after school snack, something along that lines. But they treat that as a meal period as well. Some of our biggest expenses. Uh, food has climbed to about 1.1 million. Uh, the healthy ingredients cost more. Uh, labor is at 1.17 million and climbing the year, yearly cost of living increases. Um, health insurance is our, our big one and I purposely put in fiscal year 13 because it was $266,000 and now it's $360,000 so it's gone up $100,000 in five years. And we are still self-sufficient. Um, so we have to stay ahead of the curve is, is the bottom line of it. And I was banking on it. And uh, like, for instance, the rising tide contract and council on aging, things like that. And it's helping us uh, immensely. So start looking at the towns around us. <laughs> um, the other part about that, though, and I have to recognize it and give recognition to our, my staff, is that we are at our max right now. Um, if I ask uh, one of my drivers, for instance, to go off route and deliver one thing, it will throw him completely off for the day to get the food to the students. Um, we're at that brink of, you know, to either add another, you know, small department or a person, something along that lines, if we're going to take on more responsibilities. Just being honest. <laughs> um, our total other expenses uh, mount very quickly uh, to $150,000, fuel, meals tax, uniforms, vehicle repairs, which are getting more and more. Uh, software continues to increase, license renewals, um, equipment repairs, that's a, that's a huge one. We're, knock on wood, doing okay this year. We lost some coolers last year and things like that, some big ticket items, um, but uh, we seem to be sustaining this year. Um, one of the big things is our revenue um, is, is $2.8 million a year. And of that, our reimbursements for s selling students lunch is 1.4. It's one, it's one half of it. So that's always our mainstay. That's, that's our, our main component of what we want to do. We want to we give a, a child a, a reimbursable meal, a good nutritious meal, and that always remains that. Um, and that's why we're staying afloat, because you sell more meals, the reimbursement gets larger. Any questions? Just to comment, every year you come and you present these, this data to us, it's, it's amazing. It's just amazing, all the meals you serve, the fact that you are not in the budget that you sell, it's just amazing. Mm -hmm. That's our job, very, very well done, very well done. Out of you too, as well. Mr. Uh, I was just going to ask, on the, on the summer meals, uh, they pay a s certain amount to come in? Yeah. Yes, they do. Okay. Yeah. It's above and beyond. Right? It's a, like $3.50 is what they pay us for a meal. Okay. So it's important to get qualified. One of my biggest things I'm trying to do this year, if you go over 50%, for instance, down at Cl Camp Clark, they have about 400 kids there a day. We're doing about, about 180 meals there a day. But if I can get that free and reduced lunch percentage to 50%, everybody eats for free. And I'll get back that $3.50 per meal. So a lot of these kids come from different towns. They come from Pembroke or Kingston or something like that. So 
it's in my best interest to start shaking the tree ahead of time, get everyone's names who's on the roster. Mm -hmm. And it's very it's difficult qualified. because a lot, of, a lot of parents will quite literally enroll their child the Sunday before the Monday time. So it gets difficult for me to go and say, all right, and then submit it to the state, get the approval, and then all of a sudden we become a free site. But we're really close every year. We're like 42, 43% every single year. So um, I've got to reach out to the different communities and I can get there, the names of the kids that are participating and we can hopefully get to that mark. And also do you, um, on the Council on Aging, you're just doing the meals that are, are eaten within the facility. Yes, exactly. You're not doing the uh, Meals on Wheels. Nope. They stare at it a lot, but no. <laughs> <laughs> she keeps saying no. Don't want to do it, Mr. Begley. Good presentation. Um, I thought I remembered a few years ago we talked about policy on when there's an outstanding balance, um, and I, did we agree that we would never mention to the child? that there was an outstanding balance, that we would always reach out to the parents, that the child wouldn't be embarrassed in front of peers and stuff like that. We, we do it if you want to. We tell the kid quietly um, or we write it on a piece of paper and hand it to them so that they know that they're charging. A lot of kids don't even know. They think that they right. have money on the account. And so when they go through, they just put their five digit number and like, thank you. But they don't know some of them that, that they owe money. So that child will say to them, Hold on a second, honey, and then she'll send them a piece of paper that says you owe fifty-two dollars. So that the child, we also send home every other week a letter to the parents via email, and for any balances, we also send them um, registered mail. Good, good. U.S. postage. Thank you, Mr. Costin. Thank you, uh, Patrick. Can you just address where we are in the, the pricing of our meals and any p potential increases? Great point. Um, one reason why our revenues are down slightly in the meals is because we went from 275, I don't know if you remember, from 275 to $3 this past year. We went up a quarter. Um, and that will sustain us for, and I'll put my neck on the line like I did last time, for three years at least. So I like to go up in the, rather than go up in the dime, nickel increments, it just slows the line down when you're doing cash sales. Um, and it's, it's better to get to that point and then have the rest of the world attempt to catch up at this um, juncture. But also, one neat part about our, I, I feel like we're somewhat modern, is that uh, our online payments um, are over 50% of our revenues are online payments, which is great. That speeds up the lines immensely. So This month we took in $63,000 on online payments, about $2,000, $3,000 a day. Ms. Badger. Do you have to pay credit card fees on that? Yes, you do. A dollar ninety-five. <laughs> and it's per, so you can do up to upwards of, for instance, my child eats a lot, so I put like hundred twenty dollars, <laughs> which is the max you can put yeah. on, and you put it on, and it's still <coughs> that, what dollar is it? Dollar seventy-five. Dollar seventy-five. And that, that's the parent pays the fee. That's correct. correct. The parent pays yeah. the fee. Yeah, we, okay. yes. we, don't. Yeah. we don't. The parent right. does. Okay. Yeah. Oh no, no, we don't. Right. Right. We don't yeah. I mean, Patty does it all the time. She's always talking yeah. about. Yeah. yeah. She's probably <laughs> doing it right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Little Cooper's she always doing that. Yeah. Oh. Cooper's, Cooper's a great customer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we know what he likes. He likes Cooper's notes. Yeah. He's pressing the number. Okay. Any any other questions? That was a great. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we are going to take a break and resume our meeting at 8.20. Thank you. Overnight field trip to discuss, Dr. Maestas? Yes, uh, tonight we have uh, an overnight field trip, and this is a, uh, a out-of-country field trip, and that's why it's here. It was here last year, and um, the uh, group is actually traveling this April to the Dominican Republic. They're doing a service project, and... Um, this is uh, uh, coming up uh, well in advance to be able to give the school committee opportunity to um, to listen to the to the field trip uh, opportunity for kids. But I'll turn it over to Tara and Mary. They're here tonight to bring any information that we can um, shed for the school committee. So, okay, thank you. Over. Thank you, everybody, and thank you for having us. As you know, I'm Tara Frere and Mary Raymond. So this is our fourth time in front of everybody presenting the same trip, but with a little different spin on it this year. So we've had great success the last three years 
uh, well, two years, I and mean, we have an upcoming trip that was approved last year for April 12th, where we have 20 students. This year, returning to the same um, spot in uh, El Castillo, um, very close to where Gary was, actually. Mm, and um, we have had a great success with EF tours mm -hmm. in the past, but there's been some limitations that we felt as uh, teachers, and I really can't say enough to how much this trip has affected not only the children in need in the Dominican, but the students here um, in Plymouth. The emails that we get from parents, the testimonials from the kids. Um, we have kids that return every year. Um, and as you guys know, EF Tours is a little pricey. So we've, we've found a little um, frustration, I guess you could say, with that, with the price. And some of the other reasons why we kind of changed things up this year was we really have formed an incredible partnership with the foundation um, that we work with, the sister foundation that we work with in the Dominican, and that we have worked with for the past two years and will work with again this year. And we really would like to take more charge of the project and have a little more flexibility. For instance, last year, um, typically how the trip goes is we fly into Santo Domingo, there's a little cultural tour, we head up and do the service work, and then we head out of the mountains the last day for like an excursion. Last year, the students really wanted to stay in the service area and skip the snorkeling, which I would have totally been in support of. And we couldn't because it wasn't EF approved. This year, I begged, 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 begged EF to not do the cultural tour because we have a lot of repeat students going. They've done it twice. I've done it four times. <laughs> and just to get to the mountains and get busy and roll our sleeves up and work. And they really were didn't want to hear it. They, they want to do it their way, which is that they're a very successful company and I have to respect that. So from the very first time that Mary and I went, we, we just, I think we both saw something so much bigger. So this summer we got together with some other educators in Plymouth and some other people, um, some uh, representatives from the local Rotary and um, some other business people from the South Shore. And we actually formed a nonprofit, and we called it Partnering People Through Service to kind of play on the PPS uh, school acronym there because the, that's where we're getting our roots here. And our mission statement is really clear. We want to form partnerships between students here and um, <coughs> communities in need to assist <coughs> communities to improve education and develop sustainable <coughs> practices in commerce. Some of the things that we've done so far down there, just quickly, so here's a little brief history. There's El Castillo, it's a really unique community up in the mountains. Um, these are some of our students from last year. That little tiny building that you see behind them is the schoolhouse um, that houses K through six. Most of the students in El Castillo, which is now being moved, crazily enough, to where Gary was, mm -hmm. um, in the Rio Grande area, um, they don't really have an opportunity to go past uh, the sixth grade. And that's a real problem, I think. We can all agree. This would be a typical house in the community. There might be 15 to 16 people living in that small little house. There's a big e epidemic of, obviously, um, teenage pregnancies there. There's a lot of need. So we stay at the Via Pajon Eco Lodge. It's a low impact eco lodge, which goes right along with my environmental training, um, where there's solar heat. The kids are cut off from the internet, which I really like, because mm -hmm. they are really, um, they get a little, Crazy, cranky about it, I think, yeah. when we first get there, but then at the end, they really kind of sad to pick their phones up again. It's grateful it, to the experience. Really mm -hmm. grateful, yeah. So this is just the, the community lodge there. Um, again, there's the schoolhouse that you can see how tiny it is. So some projects that we did, have done in the past. Um, in 2016, we had a student from Plymouth North. Her dad, I think, worked at, I want to say, Children's Hospital, and he was kind enough to, to round up about 10? 10 laptops maybe? 10, yeah. And um, we brought them down. And just as a, for a personal note, you know, that was the first year we had gone down. And you're always a little wary when you go to these organizations because you don't know. And we brought, we lugged this huge duffel bag of these laptops down. And it kind of just got plunked on the side. And they were like, oh, yeah, okay, thanks. And we didn't really hear much about them. And Mary and I even discussed on the plane, like, well, gee, like, what's going to happen to those laptops? They didn't really address it. We were busy the whole time. We planted 800 trees in four days. We uh, built 14 nesting boxes and constructed and installed them for an, uh, an endangered bird. Kids had a phenomenal time. But those laptops were always in the back of my mind. Well, when Mike Bestoni and I got there last year, they had all the laptops out. They had been converted into Spanish. And the kids were able to take those laptops 
um, and donate them and um, put them in the school. These are still 2016 pictures, but there's our group. We had uh, update pictures from, our, from the organization showing us the eggs in the nesting boxes. So at last year, we installed a solar panel to that little school and electrified it, which was, I can't tell you how exciting that was for our students and for the students there who had never, ever even seen a computer. The kids were able to install the laptops and one-on-one -on -one sit with the students and teach them how to use PowerPoint, how to use Word. They had no internet, but nonetheless, it was so powerful. They did some sign making for some ecotourism in the town, and they cleaned and cleared the trees that we had planted the year before. So you can see that this is a really sustainable project. And here's the kids with their laptops um, and with our students as well. Oops, I'm going to go back. I guess the, there's, um, they do lessons together, just these impromptu lessons where the Plymouth students are brushing up on their Spanish and uh, learning Spanish and teaching these kids. We play chess with them. We played baseball for a few hours with a stick and a sock. That's uh, the woman there in the blue coat is our boots on the ground. Rosie, she's amazing. She's a Rotarian from uh, Santo Domingo who's with us 24-7 there. So we're making global connections. There's the baseball game. You can see the jacket is uh, one of the bases. That little girl in the middle there is playing Emmy Kelly, who uh, we all know from her famous Gary Make the Call song. <laughs> That's her ukulele. <laughs> and then here was the group with the uh, nesting houses and making the signs for the ecotourism. So needless to say, a picture paints a thousand words. These are life-changing experiences. So Mary and I kind of came up with trying to take on the task of forming this nonprofit in the hopes of bringing the price of the trip down. Um, we have very solid connections in the Dominican, so the trip will remain exactly the same. We're going to cut out the, the tour in the city and the scuba diving or snorkeling at the end because the kids, they don't really want it. They want to be in the community and they want to work. Um, so we've changed the itinerary a little bit. We have um, partnered with the sister uh, program this year. So this year we're still with EF because it was planned last year. But we've raised for donations over $3,000 to um, have the kids. Um, we're ordering um, parts for the kids to build a solar generator for the computer. Mike Bastoni is the mastermind behind that. But um, we've done some fundraising. So our hopes are to offer the kids for the whole district, hope it, hopefully open it to south as well, uh, for two trips next year, um, April vacation, and potentially the end of June for when school is over, which may be a little tricky because we'd have to wait till we know we don't have any more snow days. But I know kids have come and told us that they want to go in April, but they have commitments with um, maybe drama or sports or something, and that they can't go at that time of year. We've done some preliminary budget, and. Um, we, we are pretty solid on that. We think we can get the trip right around $2,000, which is significantly cheaper than EF. And we also um, hope to offer some scholarships and have a panel of maybe some admin, maybe even some school committee, um, identify the needs of kids who couldn't afford to go, even if it was a little bit less. And with our fundraising um, ideas and donations that we're getting through the nonprofit, have some scholarships available for students from Plymouth. So that is our plan. That's a wonderful plan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely great. wonderful. Yeah, we're so Everybody excited about it. Everybody committee feels like, wow. Yeah. yeah, we're so excited about it. We really are. And we have a great team. Um, unfortunately, we didn't bring the whole board of directors from the nonprofit, but we have an incredible team behind us. And um, we just think it's very serendipitous that Gary ha was right down where we were going to be. So we're really hoping to make this a community with the Rotary involved, a community-based, school-based effort where Plymouth is really a shining star of community service. And hopefully we can, like Gary said, expand domestically, do some stuff, and you know, maybe in the future have even other locations. But we're super excited about it. What's really ironic is um, the community that they've been working in, the Dominican government is actually moving the Move whole them, yeah. city, the whole town from that location to the Rio Grande is to where he was. Where I was. Yeah. So um, the work that they're doing will impact that whole community. Uh, but apparently there is some ruins beyond this um, area where, where, where they're working now, where, where, you're, where the students have been working. And apparently they're going to make a national park. They're actually housed within the national yeah. park right now. So the government, um, 
we knew about this last year when we went that it was in the works that the government there was a they were sustainably if, well you saw how poor they are but the little money they were making was from agriculture and the government came along and said you know what we don't want agriculture in the park anymore and they literally just we were there for the last harvest which was so sad last year they were pulling up the last carrots of their harvest so these poor people who had creaked out this little little existence in these mountains and had this farming as their livelihood has now it's just been ripped out from under them we had um, helped make it well not helped but we helped build a sustainable stove for a jam making business for the women and the Jose who runs the sister organization he, one of the things he wants to do this year is maybe try to move that jam station because they're just they're just uprooting them yeah which is hard to believe it's, yeah I, I was su surprised at what was happening but um, the needs as you heard earlier are significant I, I think projects like this are wonderful for the kids to be part of which that's uh, a significant now, we brought some donations down last year and we had brought down some toothbrushes just basic donations and we had the kids partner up and they were giving them out and all there Joe Kelly who you've met who's presented here before he came up with a little boy and he said he told me he has 13 more siblings living in those little houses could he have a few more toothbrushes mm -hmm. I was like, here, <laughs> 20 toothbrushes and some. Yeah, I, it, it, oh. it's just amazing for our students to go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It really is. And make a contribution. It is they equally. They know in their heart they yeah. made the contribution. It's equally beneficial. It yep. really is. Yep. It really is. And we're super excited about it. It's <clears> powerful <throat> that they are expressing that they would rather be doing this work than be on the excursion. That's what I was going to say. The fluff. It's, yes. it's, that says a lot about what it means to mm -hmm. them to be there. Yeah. I, I, when I was in high school, I went to Appalachia and spent a week doing this kind of work. An experience that just changed my life. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I know it's, I know yeah. it. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Other committee members? That's fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. I just, I just wanted to ask Gary on when you were there, you were taking pictures mm. of those kids. Uh, mm. Did you take somebody with you with the camera? Is it? Well, it's life no, um, well, well, li well, you know, you have to understand that life touch, we, we had, 50 high-end cameras following you everywhere. But all the pictures that I took, I used my phone and I, I would have somebody take the picture for me. Oh. So all the pictures that I shared with Rich Harbert from the OCM were all from my, my phone. Oh, okay. Um, but if you go online um, on the Life Touch website, uh, uh, Facebook page, there are a lot of very high quality pictures of, of all the experiences, which is um, mm -hmm. pretty neat. But I thought you were doing individual pictures. I'd never had yeah, we did individual pictures. Where what's what was really a, was was um, pretty exciting, and I, I know that, that the kids that you work with would have loved this. Where uh, Life Touch is a school photo company. Well, they they actually took the whole set and they set up a classroom and they did family students oh, so it was a student photo photos yeah. and family photos. And when the students mm -hmm. and their families got the pictures, some of those those families have never ever had a picture. Yeah, um, it was to see their faces of getting a family picture yeah. was it, it was would, pretty yeah, amazing that would, that would blow it away yeah it was it amazing yeah. we had right. a student this Avery Fornicari I'll just tell this story quickly and she brought the first year she brought one of those Polaroid cameras down <laughs> and she was giving the kids the pictures and she gave one to one of the the dads who was working with us and he kept touching his pocket and I said oh is that your son and he took it out and of course my Spanish isn't great his English was not great and he said, it's the only, the only picture I have of him. Yeah. And some of the kids had never seen themselves. Never they, mirrors. Mm. Oh they just stare at him like yeah. in amazement <laughs> that that's what I look like. You know? mm. yeah. 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 Well, this is an action item. I'll move Mr. Bagley. I'll move it. That Mr. Bagley moves the recommendation of administration. Mrs. Burgess is the second on a question. I have one question, Mr. Costin. The application where you would sign off on it it's written no contract, but there's a bus involved here, and I think an airline. So wouldn't wouldn't you have to sign off on this? Excuse me. I I would think um, I think we need to kind of work through how the nonprofit is going to f handle the funds, um, and then make arrangements with with the travel purveyors. Yeah. Yeah, we've lines, et briefly touched base with the travel agent, but I didn't want to waste too much of our time pending approval. But yes, definitely. So, and the the nonprofit has a, is in the process of having a website set up where people can 
sign up through the the website for the nonprofit. But, but I, I think uh, we would want Mr. Carson to sign off on the uh, uh, sure on the uh, overnight field trip application. Okay, that's <coughs> fine. So should we just should I just email you to meet on that? <coughs> Okay. I think that'd be fine. Thank you. I think what I would uh, also uh, recommend is that um, if there's any um, model of transaction of funds that happens, I think Mr. Kossin might be able to help with how that happens. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think yes, that, that he, can, be, he can help guide that. So that would I think be very that would helpful. Be good to do. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, okay. definitely. Yeah. No. Okay. Any other questions on the motion? Ms. Burgess. Yeah, um, on this too, <clears throat> what about health insurance for the kids if they don't have it? For health insurance, um, I don't know how much health, health we have. Med. We have contacted um, a for liability. We haven't really delved into the health insurance, but that would be more like a travel insurance, right? That yeah. the travel yeah, health there's, insurance. There's one in Connecticut. I think it's AIFS that does the Rotary students. Yep. Mm -hmm. I can give you that information. Great. If yeah, you and we've yeah. we've um, spoken but, with Bob Hollis about the liability. Yeah, he does the liability yeah, for uh, the yeah. charter school yeah. for Rising Tide. So that's who we're going to go through for liability. Dr. Maestas, do you want to add something? And we can help with that too. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay, then let's take the vote on this, please. Hmm. Okay, everybody has voted in favor. Thank you so That's much. Excellent. Thank you. We'll keep you posted, Thank and you so we're much. so excited. Thank Goodbye. you very much. Thank, Thank you. Good Thank presentation. You. It is exciting. Hmm. And now our next item is the medication guidelines policy, Mr. Morgan. Um, yes, um, we are proposing changes to the medication guidelines. You'll see on page three of seven um, where we struck a paragraph and replaced it with the one that's highlighted. And basically, our, our goal is on a, volunt a voluntary basis to allow um, um, teachers and whatnot to be able to um, hand out um, prescription uh, medication. Uh, as you know, we've had issues in the past trying to get enough nurses to go on uh, overnight trips, um, out-of-state trips. Um, so. Um, the, the proposed language, um, and it's very specific um, that um, the folks are trained, it's voluntary, it's prescription medication, um, and um, we feel that uh, this is at the recommendation of the uh, um, nurse, nurse leader. So. Okay. Committee members, with a discussion about this policy bef before we go to a motion, I have a couple of I have a couple of uh, items, uh, Mr. Morgan, and or sen central office about this policy. Uh, one is very minor. Uh, at 4.2 on the second page, uh, it refers to Department of Education guidelines for special education. I, I think in that reference, special education should be uppercase. We're talking about the Department of Special Education Students, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but the other ones I have are more substantial. Uh, Mr. Morgan, I, I don't understand on the next page, three, uh, it says field trips. And then below that, that 5.3 in yellow, which in yellow on my sheet, that, that's what's being added, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. What I don't understand is that 5.3 references the administration of emergency medication under the title of field trips. So my question would be, we administer emergency medication plenty of places, not just on field trips. So I was wondering why that paragraph under the administration of emergency medication comes under the topic of field trips. This was specific. To that. This was speci trip. specific for uh, if you didn't have a nurse going on the trip on with the, trip. the uh, yeah. You know the, the yes. kids, uh -huh. so but, but, but that's why it's there under field trips. Right. But, but I'm general. thinking, I'm thinking that it, it, it should be under it's there be under field trips. But it should be, yeah. it, we emergency medication occurs every day. Yeah. yeah. So we should have a paragraph else. somewhere referencing emergency medication in the policy, other than the one that's referenced under field trips. 
It's probably covered elsewhere. I, I read it and I didn't. This is specific to field trips, correct? Yes. Always, specific yep. to even though it's administered every day, if the circumstance is at a field trip, that's why it's in the policy. Mr. Sally, will you, will you explain what you're saying? No, I'm just saying it's specific to the field trip, right? It's well, specific it, way, to it. Yes. In this, in that circumstance, that emergency medication he's, is he's required. I understand thing. it's he daily. Why it's it isn't somewhere 3. else That's as well. 7, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 5.0 refers to field trips, but in regards to. Well, because in, if you go to like 4.7, response to medication yes. emergencies. Yeah, that, that's different. That's in general. Yeah, that's general. That's, that's a like medication emergency. Not a, that, that, that's a medication emergency. Okay. This is the administration of emergency medication. They're different on that page. Yeah, one's putting it. One's an emergency. This is the administration of emergency. By the way, well, anyway, so what I'm thinking is maybe this may have to go back to policy, because what I'm thinking is that that paragraph about the administrating, administration of emergency medication should exist in the policy uh, and, and it, it occurs in field trips, but it occurs during the day as well, mm -hmm. at any day. So I want you to, you know, and I certainly, I'll, I'll take my recommendation from the policy committee, but okay, so I'm going to move on from that one because I have another one here that's minor, the one that Mr. Begley just referenced, 4.7.1, it reads, that poses an immediate threat to the health or well-being of the student. Now we know that some of these, particularly some of the psychotropic medications and the stimulant medications, end up uh, uh, threatening the well-being of other students because stimulant medication sometimes causes these angry outbursts. So I think that that sentence ought to read, threat to the health or well-being of a student or any other student. Because I could see somebody arguing, saying, well, my, my child wasn't being threatened by the medicine, but the other students were, and it's not there. So I would, I would send that back to the policy subcommittee. And, and again, I'll take your recommendation when it comes back. And I think there was one more. Can I move on? I have another one, Bob, sure. for you to think about. I'm on page five, which is 7.5. It reads, parents or guardians may retrieve their child's medications from the school during any school day. I would prefer that to read, after making arrangements with the school nurse, parents or guardians may retrieve their medication on any school day. I don't want parents just walking into the building willy-nilly and going down to the nurse's office and saying, I want the medicine. So you want it specifically stated rather than implied here, because yep. right now it's implied. Right now it's implied. That's correct. Okay. What's the pleasure of the committee on this? Do we want to have this come back to us, or or, or you want to approve it? We just take it back to the policy committee. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, I think so. Okay. So enough of it to go back. Yeah. So if it's only one item. It'd be different. But. We'll send it back to you, and then you can bring it back to us. Sure. Okay. So that we won't take an action on this tonight. And now we're going to go to uh, job descriptions. Ms. Fry. Yes. Um, these are our three final paraeducator job descriptions. Um, and in the contract, it reads vocational paraeducator. And we, after meeting with the vocational staff, um, we group them into three specific areas. Um, I did want to make one point that when we posted these, we had removed the word such twice in our final. And I it was posted it. yesterday, and I changed it this morning. Because yeah, we, we had already finished these before that in the last, <laughs> if that makes sense, the such <laughs> conversation. Um, so the first one is vocational paraeducator general. Um, and this paraeducator is in one of the vocational programs, kind of general areas, could be construction, could be allied health, um, more general programs where there is not an exchange of money at all. So that makes this one different. So it's more for supervisory reasons, the general category one vocational paraeducator. I don't know if you have any specific questions. Sorry. Any questions Anyways. on this? I am going to make a general, general question. Sure. Uh, and it will apply to all of them. 
at the last time we had these, I had said that I thought the 504 plan should not be subject to et cetera. It should be listed the with the IEP. IEP on number 12 on each one. Yes. Yep. We're doing that as well. That's okay. a, we, had, we now have a document of all the consistent pieces that's okay. in a, the Google Drive. Yes. Having said that, we can take mm -hmm. a motion. Uh, we can accept a, uh, a motion on this one. Ms. Burgess? Moves to approve as, yeah. as recommended. Mm -hmm. Is there a second? Yeah. Ms. Badger is a second. So we have Mrs. Burgess and Mrs. Bur Badger. That's right. Okay. Any questions on the motion? Okay, so let's take the vote on the uh, first one. Okay, that's good. And now the... Yes. Um, the next one is vocational power educator for the school store. And um, this job has changed dramatically because we no longer sell food in the school stores. With, you've heard some of the guidelines and things like that. So it's managing inventory and programmatic pieces. So um, this is very similar and um, it's in our school store in both high schools. Okay. So we're going, this is 8.5 on our agenda. Mm -hmm. Okay. Did you do 8.5? Four. Tag one of order. No, it was eight point oh, tag one order. I apologize. Yeah. You went ahead. I went ahead of myself. Yeah. I apologize. Well, we'll do eight point five. We can figure that we out. Can okay. figure it out. Right. Uh, <laughs> any motion on this one? We have to get Miss Badger. I move that we approve it. Okay. As seconded by Mrs. Tricelli. Any question on the school store vocational power educator? Okay. We'll take the vote on that one. Didn't come up. It came up and it went. Oh, agents. hold on. Sorry. We had it and it kind of no, went right. What was that one? 8.5. That was my fault. School store vocational power education. My fault. We're going to. Can you refresh my. Uh... Here we go. There, it goes. there you go. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. I moved okay. ahead. I was thinking about going Okay, back. everybody vote in favor. And now the vocational power educator. Yes, the final one is um, vocational power educator, culinary, um, and that is the individual who works in the school restaurant and handles reservations and booking and all of the um, intake of funds and things of that nature. So that is the third one this evening. Okay. Any questions? Take a motion. Move. Ms. Hunt moves it. Seconded by Ms. Bur Ms. Badger. Any questions to the motion? All right, we'll take a vote. And just so folks know, moving forward, we'll be um, housing all these obviously through Electronic School Board, but on our new web page that um, Mrs. Targi and Mrs. Colby are working on, they'll on the Human Resources page. Job descriptions will be a major piece of it because right now they're a little difficult to find. So we're beginning that moving over of those documents. So. Uh, the results came, came up, up with that no I votes. Voted and I yeah, yeah. I think yeah. Oh, no way, really. Yeah. That was good. Gary, yeah. yeah. I don't know how you did that, but you voted for all of us. I think we all had voted, voted. prior to. It we says we all voted. <laughs> we voted. I thought I was going to vote anyway. Is anybody but opposed though. to it? Yeah. No. I don't know how you did that. that was works, pretty, right? pretty I would like to know, too. <laughs> 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 All right. Well, I think we all voted. I you think all it was voted. All yes, we there. voted we in favor. It's unanimous. Yeah, we had all voted. <laughs> it didn't come up. Well, no, I page. don't even hit the oh, button. Right. Right. I think all we right. confused the system because we went out of order. Sorry. Yes. Uh, <laughs> okay, so now we're going to go to school fundraisers. Anything to, uh, to speak to that from anybody? Nothing? No. Committee reports. Uh, reports and proposals from school committees. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Badger. Ms. Badger. I just wanted to say that we did a, um, had another Pilgrim Area Collaborative meeting and I was going to be ready in two seconds, but I apparently don't have the sheet I was looking for. But anyways, we are doing a search right now for the new director uh, and we will be having a, and everybody's invited obviously to our meeting in April on April 5th will be when we'll have a community wide, it will be an interview with the board, but ev the community will be invited to that. So that's our next step in all of that. Um, and as in the past, I've done the um, Pam Mass Kids ride, and I like to put a plug here. It's on June 14th at Charge Pond, and it's going to be our sixth year, so um, we're excited about that. And then I just wanted to say, and I know I'm sure Mr. Morgan will mention it, but I went to the Beauty and the Beast production, and the kids did a phenomenal job, yep. phenomenal. And I was in the nosebleeds, like way in the back. <laughs> the place was crowded. It was just a really great atmosphere, and the kids did amazing. Two shows sold out. Yep. Yeah, amazing. Great. I had never been that far back before. <laughs> it's like the wall is right there. 
I was so sad. Mm. Yeah, I went. Yeah. Other, other reports and proposals? <laughs> Mr. Morgan? Um, oh, ditto on the um, Beauty and the Beast. I was in the third row. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> very good. Um, I also had a question. Uh, I got a, f a flyer in the mail from Mass reg regarding Day on the Hill, and do we plan to attend? We didn't go last year. Um, Day on the Hill last year was relocated to another yeah, it venue. Yeah, it is culinary, culinary wasn't year. serving. Uh, culinary is serving this year, but I'm not sure of the and venue. In another building, though. It didn't identify where it was, so uh, oh. it's at the State House? Mm -hmm. Okay. No, oh, was it the state house? No, he's talking about this year. This year. Yeah. Last oh, this year. year. No, no, last year it wasn't. This year it was, but I thought they said it was in a different building. Well, anyway, well, it's not anyway, the same building I, that they're meeting anyway. Yeah, I, I actually have some meetings that day. Um, so if people want to go, uh, you know, they are serving uh, a culinary, the culinary schools are serving lunch, but um, it's going to have to, you know, if, We'll just take a sign up, see who wants to go. Uh, typically, we take our students, so we'll have to see if the students want to go. Okay, and then the only other thing I was going to bring up is um, regarding the uh, school committee on the road. This year it was a little different format where you went during the school day and you got a different perspective. I've seen the kids actually in classrooms, which is great. Um, but for some of us, that's a challenge. Uh, when it's during the day, either we don't have ability to leave work to go, or like myself, work in Boston or out of town, can't go. So my proposal is next year, if we have school committee on the road, you know, we maybe can mix it up every other year, but we kind of go back to the other, the old format, where it's uh, maybe have the meeting a half hour, hour early, and do the tour of the school or meet with some of the students. But it's just, it's, you know, it's great to see the videos and the pictures, but just can't, you know, 9 o'clock, 9.30 on a Tuesday or something. It's just hard for myself and maybe for others to participate. My, my suggestion it would be instead of every other year, mix it up in one year and do yeah. two, two in the day and two at night or mm. something like yeah, that. Yeah, whatever works. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. I agree. That's all I have. That's a, that's a good proposal, mm -hmm. Mr. Morgan. Thank you. Uh, just a, just a connection to that, I had raised this uh, a while back. I, I, for one, would really like to do, uh, and I realize during, this is during the day, I'm sorry for that. I would like to do one of those things at Plymouth South High School, the new school. Mm -hmm. I want to see it, yeah. having been on the building committee, yeah. I'd love to see it in action. In action, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Instead of, yeah. Mm -hmm. I would see that. that would be great. I agree. Okay, we can, we can arrange that. And I have uh, other, other reports and proposals, Mrs. Burgess. Yes, um, I just, well, of course I did Beauty and the Beast, but beyond that, um, I, uh, last Monday night, I did this, I had met with Gary Carson and I took uh, the Plymouth School's uh, energy, how we've done from 2010 to now and how we're sustainable at 100% and giving back to the town. I did that presentation, but I also did the PowerPoint that was presented at town meeting about the uh, canopies up for the, and for the lights on the fields and things like that. And it went over very big. A man from Co one of the town officials from Cohasset called me, but also they asked for more information. Other towns are calling That's the great. woman that runs the Sustainable South Shore. Because there's 21 communities and they are mostly people f that work in the towns. So you're talking to a very good audience about that. And I'd been working with her and trying to, to get our message out because she kept thinking it was one school that we were doing. It. <laughs> I couldn't get it, even on, the, even on the agenda it said one school, but it was all of the schools. Actually, it was all 14 of our buildings because we do it for them all. So, uh, but anyhow, I just wanted to say right, that good, I did great, do good, that. Good, good, good. Um, and then there were a few of us that had the opportunity to have dinner mm -hmm. the other night oh, with right. the yeah. artists from Plymouth, England. Um, and that was a great experience. It was nice to hear more about what the program actually entails yeah. and who's involved with it. And I've actually talked to some students that said, oh, yeah, we're involved in that project. So she, it's great. Joey is. Yeah, yeah, yeah Joey is. Yeah, she yeah. is. So it was really, it was really fun to to go and, and experience that as well. 
A great meal by our food oh, yeah. services. And, yeah, I was going to actually <laughs> mention it when they were here. The food services <laughs> provided yeah, an amazing meal. It was good. They always do. Oh, they great. always do a good job, yep. Okay. How many of the time caps are tonight? Oh, I found my schedule. Now we've got to go on, too. That's right. Also under... Uh, some proposals from committee members. Okay, then we'll go PYDC. Is there a report this evening? Uh, no, that'll be uh, this Friday morning. And building committee, there's no report? No, that's uh, this Thursday night. <laughs> personnel. Excellent. Yes. Um, we have two certificated appointments, um, four coach or advisor appointments, three classified appointments, one leave of absence, and two resignations. Thank you. Any questions on the personnel? Um, solar projects, Mr. Carson. Thank you. We um, we are continue to working with uh, the vendor, the selected vendor. Uh, currently, the um, attorneys are involved putting together the PPA, and we'll be bringing that forward uh, hopefully soon to the school committee uh, for the canopies and the um, uh, rooftop, uh, the um, battery, and the. Um, Lights, uh, we're working separately with those, how we're going to put together a contract for those, and uh, we, we continue to work on those items. I made a lot of progress on a, in a short, few short weeks of this mm -hmm. year. Yeah. <coughs> we're, we're, we're working on it, believe me. Diligently. Okay. <clears throat> Accounts payable? Ms. Hunt. Okay. Where school committee members have been provided with a copy of the cost center transfer and transaction summary report and the warrant review for review, I move that the Plymouth School Committee accept and approve the report and accounts payable warrant number S020818 dated February 8, 2018 in the amount of $1,154,246.94 as presented. I'll second. That was seconded by uh, Mrs. Burgess. No, no, Mr. Dennis. Mr. Begley. Oh, Dennis, I'm sorry. I was, I was reading that number. Let me see. Okay. Finish your voice. I was doing something else. <laughs> okay. Uh, all those in favor, we'll vote. <laughs> Am I the only one getting the cruise control pop up? Yeah. Nobody else getting the oh. network issues? Nope. No. Nope. Not tonight. I have in the past, but not tonight. Now your votes counted though. Yeah, the vote's working and then I get the network. Okay, everybody voted in favor. <laughs> Doesn't matter. That's too funny. Okay. We have the minutes of December the fourth. Mrs. Bird Badger. I move that we um, approve the December 4th minutes as presented. Okay. Seconded by Ms. Tricelli. Is there a question on the 4th? Mm -hmm. Okay. I guess we can vote. Maybe. <laughs> there it is. Okay, they've been approved by everybody. And now we have the minutes of December the 18th. Ms. Hunt. Um, I move that we accept the minutes as written. The 18th, second by Ms. Badger. <laughs> Question, any questions on the 18th? No. Okay, we can vote for that. Okay, we have one abstention. I wasn't Everybody there. Else. I'm sorry? I wasn't at the meeting. Yes, we have one abstention, everybody else voting in favor. <coughs> so we have some books to pass on, Dr. Maestas. <laughs> yes, tonight we have a number of books, and this is from Plymouth South High School, and um, these are, uh, many of them are duplicates, and books will be donated to uh, Big Hearted Books, and um, they're no longer, some of them have, are, are no longer current uh, editions. So if you take a look at, there's a, uh, a long list. And this, this is a list that is generated from the library. So what they have, have done is they go through and, and, and weed the library book, of, of, you know, the library collection of books. And um, 
it's something that we have been doing regularly, so you may see these in the future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is, do we ever like talk to the Plymouth Public Library uh, and see if they want any of these books before we donate them to external groups? We haven't in the past, but I can definitely inquire. Yeah, and just with, yeah. with uh, for some reason, it saying duplicates made me think, oh, library. I don't know why I haven't yeah. thought of it. They usually don't. Years ago, they usually put them for sale. Yeah, fifty cents. Fifty cents. Yeah. Like yeah. That. Yeah. yeah, We will. We will definitely um, yeah. do that. Okay. The, yeah, we. I will ask. Okay. Just worth. So we have a motion to move these books on. Uh, no, the, this is an action item, so we don't have a motion yet. Uh, Mrs. Burgess moves it, seconded by Ms. Hunt. Any questions? Okay. Time to vote. Okay, that passes unanimously. And is there any other business to come before the school committee? Seeing no hands. We will stand adjourned at 9 p.m.